You can uh, take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 45. You know, one of the things I appreciate about the uh, lessons we have for the children down in Children's Church is the emphasis on the attributes of God to help build their faith at a young age to understand who the Lord is. And uh, even little Walker gets, he loves to talk about God's all-powerful omnipotence. He understands that, you know, he, lock, he can latch onto that. But it's good for us to know who the Lord is. So we're going to look at Isaiah 45, begin with two verses, and then we're going to look at three examples, and the title I have tonight's message is Glimpses of God's Glory. You know, we haven't seen the Lord with our eyes, but we can look through the eyes of faith in the Word of God and understand who He is. But Isaiah 45, verses 5 and 6, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know that from the rising of the sun and from the west, and that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Father, as we look at your word tonight, I pray the word that you'll help us to have a, a little bit of glimpse of who you truly are, and may it encourage our hearts, Lord, in our worship and service of you. Uh, to focus, Lord, though we've never seen you with our eyes, we believe in you and trust in you, and we know that you are the only God. There, You are the only one that can hear us, the only one that can answer our needs. You're the only one worthy of worship. And tonight, as we look at the word, may it sink in our hearts and encourage us, Lord, in our service for you. For it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So here we see in this passage here that the Lord declaring that he is the only God. You know, one of the some of the attributes we teach the little kids, you know, we teach, of course, is that God is omnipotent, that he's all-powerful. We teach that he is omniscient, that he knows everything. He, that we teach he's omnipresent, you know, the three O's we tell the kids. God is the one that is all able to do anything. He knows everything. He's everywhere at once. But the fact is, he's the only being in the universe that's that way. There is no one else that can claim any of those attributes. You know, God also is immutable. We teach that one to the kids. That means he never changes. You know, what God is, he always has been and always will be. He's not like us. We humans, we change our mind all the time. You know, we we can grow. God doesn't have to grow. He is who he is. We also teach that God is eternal. He's the only being in the universe that is eternal. You know, all of us have had a beginning. God has had no beginning. He is from everlasting to everlasting. In other words, he's been around since eternity past and will be around forevermore. But God is the only one in the universe that can claim that. No other being, even the angels, they were created. You know, God is the only one that's eternal. And, of course, one of the biggest attributes we talk about is God's holiness. Now, when we think of holiness, the first thing that comes to mind is the morality side of it. You know, God is absolutely without sin. But this verse emphasizes another aspect of God's holiness, and the fact that God is separate from his creation. God is completely different than us. That's another aspect of God's holiness. There is none else like God. No one else, no other being in the universe is like God. You know, so here, looking at the attributes of God, we can understand a little bit of what God is like. But I want to look at three examples in the Bible of, you know, times when God revealed a little bit of his glory to man. And the first one we're going to look at it, and we're not going to look at all the passages we've been here a long time, but Moses, when he went and got the commandments from the Lord and asked to see the Lord's face, you know, this is in Exodus 33.
In verse 18, I, he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. So Moses requested of the Lord to see his glory. And we're not going to read the whole story, but remember, the Lord explained to Moses, no man can see my face and live. Moses, you can't do this, but what I'll do is I'll hide you in the rock and I'll cover you with my hand and I'll pass by and show you my backside. Just the very smallest fraction of God's glory is all Moses was able to see. You know, no being could withstand the unfiltered glory of the Lord and live. And we remember what happened when Moses came down from the mountain because of his time with the Lord his face shone with the glory of the Lord, and the people couldn't stand it. He had to wear a veil on his face. So there's three lessons I draw from this experience. First of all, that glory that was shining from Moses' face, it was a reflection of God's glory. It wasn't Moses. It was, it was just from being in the presence of God. That reflected glory. You know, we know that the world hates the Lord, you know, because... It reminds us of our own sinfulness, you know, here. And the fact that Moses was reflecting the glory of God, you know, the people couldn't take it. He had to cover his face. Also, it came from this intense fellowship he had with the Lord. Remember that Moses fasted 40 days and 40 nights before he went up the mountain, had this great fellowship with the Lord. And when he came down, the glory of the Lord was just shining from, excuse me, from his face. <clears throat> Take a little sip here, sorry. But that the glory of the Lord was being reflected from Moses because of that time he spent with the Lord on the mountain. And the people were afraid. So they had to cover his face. So the glory of the Lord brings fear to men when we realize how great the Lord really is and it shows how small we are. And the second example I want us to consider is Isaiah when he was in the temple in Isaiah 6. This is a very famous passage. But Isaiah 6, and we're going to begin at verse 5, but the background is uh, Isaiah was in the temple, and he saw the Lord high and lifted up, he said, he, and he saw the angels around him crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Verse 3, cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And verse 5, look at Isaiah's reaction. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So that word undone, he was completely un, you know, overwhelmed by the presence of God. When when he was in the temple, he got to see God as he really is. And when he saw God as he really is, it did something to him. He found he saw himself as he really was. When we get a glimpse of the Lord and how holy and how pure and how wonderful he is, we get a, a, an overwhelming idea of how great God is and how small we are. But one of the first things it does is it reveals how sinful and needful we are as a people. You know, one of the, the Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We have to understand that we are sinful people and are needy, and we can come to the Lord to get what we need from him. But we come with much awe and reverence. You know, that's the problem is the people who don't have a fear of the Lord 
it, they have no restraint on their actions because they don't feel there's any repercussion for anything they do. If you don't have a fear for the Lord, you're not going to care about what you do. You don't care about sin. You ignore it. You just do what you want to do. But here, Isaiah is, and Isaiah is a what we would consider he's a godly man. He's you know he's a great man in, in our standing. But when he sees the Lord, he says, "I am completely undone. I'm overwhelmed. I'm ruined." You know, the Lord is here, and I am a man of unclean lips, and my people are unclean. He saw his sin and the sins of his nation. So when we have a just a little glimpse of who God is from the word and reflect upon ourselves, we see that we're sinful and that our people around us are sinful. You know, that's why we have, you know, prayer meetings so much. And one of the biggest things we pray for is the spiritual needs of our lost loved ones. You know, we were prayed for my uncles tonight, and I appreciate that. You know, I pray for them daily because they grew up in church. They know that they know the Bible. They've heard it you know, when they were little boys. They know the truth, but they've turned their back on it. But the only hope they have is to turn to God. The only hope our nation has. You know, I heard some people talking about the debates last night. I watched a little bit of myself, but you know, I'm not putting my hope for this country in any any political candidate. It's only in the Lord. And if God's people would get serious about trying to reach our neighbors and having their hearts changed by being saved and having Jesus in their heart, that's the only way this country would really have a lasting change. But Isaiah here, he is completely overwhelmed by, by the sight of God. He is undone and he looks at himself as a sinful person. So when we get a glimpse of God's glory and see him as he truly is, we are overwhelmed and we see ourselves as we truly are. And then the third one, uh, the third glimpse of glory is the transfiguration. You know, when the when Peter, James, and John went with the Lord up on the high mountain and God kind of peeled back a little bit of the veil and showed Jesus as he really was, it greatly impacted them. You know, it's similar, you know, the way, just the way Moses had to wear a veil over his face, Jesus had veiled his divinity when he became a man and became, you know, a, a simple, the Bible says he had no form or cleanliness that we would follow him. So he was clothed as an ordinary person. You know, if Jesus walked around, we wouldn't recognize who he really was, but God used this time to take those three men up on that mountain and give them a glimpse of who his son really was. Now, there's a big difference here. We know the story how Jesus was praying and the, the three disciples that were with him, they fell asleep. And while he was praying, the glory of the Lord shone forth through Jesus. And they woke up and, you know, they were, Greatly afraid, and of course, Peter, being who he was, had no idea what to do. So he said, hey, Lord, it's a good thing we're here. Let's build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. You know, he was ready to, to get the kingdom started. He was all excited. He, he didn't, and the Bible says he said that because he was afraid and didn't know what to say. But there's a big difference here between Jesus shining with the glory of God and Moses. When Moses' face shone with God's glory, it was just a reflection of God's glory. But when Jesus shone with the glory of God, it was his own glory. So that's the first thing that's different here. In the transfiguration, Jesus was shining with his true glory. That was his nature. And it says that he was transfigured. Now, we don't use that word transfigured very much, but you know, we've heard, we have that root word is the word that we get the word metamorphosis from. And some of you little kids who might be taking science might know what metamorphosis is. That's like when a caterpillar changes from a little grub to a butterfly. That's a metamorphosis, a complete change in form. And that's what that word, the same word we get that from. It's that same word that we see in Romans 12 too, where God says, be transformed, a complete change in form. 
So Jesus, his physical body, his form was completely changed to reveal the glory that was always there. And those three disciples had those the privilege of being there to see the the glory of the Lord as it really was. You know, it's an and it's amazing that you know Jesus had the humility to clothe all of that glory to be a man just like you and us because of the purpose that he came for. You know, they were looking for the Messiah to come and be a political ruler. You know, we're not much different today. <laughs> we are looking for our hope in who's going to be the next president. That's not where our hope's going to come from. It comes from God. It comes from our relationship with Jesus Christ. We know that God's the one that's in control and what his will will be done. Whether we have a good president or a bad one, it doesn't really matter in the long run because God's purposes will be accomplished. So here they're looking for someone to save them from Rome. But Jesus had a much greater purpose in mind. This is just before he goes to the cross. And I believe that he showed them this glory to encourage them. If you remember what happened just before this, it's when he revealed that he was going to die. And Peter said, no, not so, Lord. That's not going to happen. That, that's not what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to rule on the reign for us. You know, we don't want you to die. But they, he, Peter didn't understand God's plan. So in this transfiguration, it was his own glory, and it was a complete change in his form. And notice that the disciples, they were terrified to be in his presence. Now, this is their Lord and Master that they'd been following for about three years now. They knew Jesus. They knew him well, and they knew he was God. But it's one thing to see with the eyes of faith. Here, they were seeing God with their own natural eyes. You know, they didn't have to just trust it by faith. They saw he really is who he is. We knew he was. But we get to see it with our own eyes. You know, sometimes we think, well, if I could just have a glimpse of God's glory, yeah, that would change my life. But brothers... We have everything we need to see God's glory right here in the word. We just have to trust that what God says is true. We have a more sure word of prophecy, as the Bible tells us. You know, we don't have to have been there and walked with him in Galilee and followed him around to know that Jesus is God. We can understand from the scriptures and with the Holy Spirit's help who the Lord really is. And when we see God as who he is, we understand who we are. There is no hope and help in ourselves. Just like Isaiah, we are sinful. We know when we spend time with the Lord that we are people of unclean lips. We are not the solution to the problems. Only the Lord can be the solution to our problems. And when we see God as he truly is, you know, see a little bit of his glory, that encourages us to worship him and serve him as he deserves to be worshiped and served. I look forward to the day when I can stand before him and see him face to face. And uh, closing, I have an illustration here. Uh, you know, back, I think it was 2011, there was a popular song. It hit, it was so popular, it was a Christian song, but it, it was so popular that it, they played it on regular radio. I remember when I, was, when I was working, they used to keep the radio on unforced, and it was a song I can only imagine. And the guy, sings in the song about what it's going to be like to stand with the Lord. What would I do? And he says, would I, you know, will I dance before him? Will I pray? What will I do? Well, I think I have a good idea from Revelation chapter one and seeing what John's reaction was when he saw the Lord in a vision. What happens is he, I fell down as I was dead. You know, even John, who, if you say, take a poll, which disciple of the 12, do you think was closest to Jesus? Well, where do you see John every time you read him and bottom? him? He's, I'm the one that's leaning on Jesus' breast. I'm the one that's right up close to him. I'm always that close to him. But when he saw Jesus as he is now in heaven in his full glory, he couldn't take it. He said, I fell down as I were dead. And God had to give him the strength to bear even John, who, if you would ask me, which one of those disciples 
it was the closest to him. I would maybe say John may be. But it shows us who how God really is, the glory that God is. And one day we'll get to see him face to face. God will give us that strength to be there. He'll have to change us. Uh, we're not going to be like these bodies anymore. You know, in the Old Testament, God warned Moses, no man can see my face and live. But because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, one day, those of us who believe, we will see God face to face. And what is our reaction going to be? One of my favorite things about Revelation is you see over and again, the saints of God worshiping God and declaring how he's worthy of all honor and all glory and all power and all wisdom and strength. When we can see God as he really is, we'll truly be able to worship him as he deserves finally. We do the best we can right now in these frail, sinful bodies. We come to church and we hear God's word and we pray and we sing praises to him. But you and I both know it falls far short of what God truly deserves. We do the best we can, but one day we'll be able to worship God as he truly deserves to be worshiped forever and ever. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the truth of